Muchas gracias por la, la teva participación. Okay, so, good morning. So, well, sorry. So we are a small group today, so I'm super happy. So I can just like work around and take the opportunity to get some uh, feedback from you. So we have approximately one hour together. Um, and you made me the honor to invite me today um, to give this talk on transforming the economy through education. So we have one hour together. I will try to make five big points, um, 10 minutes each. So my main points uh, will be to tell you a bit more about the student movement. So what is the core message of the student movement to transform the economic curriculum? Um, who is a student in economics here? Is there anyone who is a student, currently a student in economics? Okay, so that's Let even better. Later, later no problem. They will arrive. So it's even better. So I can. So you're not gonna hear some things you already know. Um, the second thing is I want to introduce um, some kind of idle curriculum that have been designed by various organizations. So um, the, the student movement is very diverse. It's in uh, Chile, Israel, France, in the UK. But I wanted to come up with uh, something that that has a that was a consensual uh, for some professors and from students. So it can be a good base uh, for you to uh, have an idea of how we think and also that we can start the dialogue. Um, my third point will be about, um, so it will be about how we can study entrepreneurship and digital economy and how on this topic we can actually apply uh, everything you mentioned about pluralism. So how to integrate different uh, disciplines, how to integrate different methods and how to integrate uh, several theories. And I will close by uh, introducing you to some of the current initiative uh, on how to change textbooks, on how a student has created the journals, on how some professors in Europe has created completely alternative master courses. Mm -hmm. So to so give you some idea of where we can maybe some find some collaboration. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's in the spirit of like, I'm here many years a connector. So it's really, the idea is really to um, give you an idea of what other people are doing in the same spirit as in this cathedral. And I will close with some maybe historical perspective and how economics education has been shaped because it's important even as, a, as an activist to have some tools and to see that maybe in the 20s in the US they had exactly the same claim uh, than us. So that was, that's a bit the, the main outline for, um, for this morning. So now maybe, um, wha wha what's the spirit um, of our, our time together? So I'm not going to take any position related to research. So who is a professor in economics here? Who is, who is currently teaching economics? OK, so I'm going to look at you for <laughs> the specific <laughs> feedback. So I'm not going to comment on the, I mean, we can talk about this, but on the state of economic research, because sometime Economic research is more advanced than economic teaching, and also um, it's better to really focus on the teaching that is a topic. Um, the second thing is that um, I'm I'm not gonna maybe of course we have some preferences, but I'm not, I'm not gonna say okay we should study this specific theory or that specific theory. So I can say okay maybe Austrian economics that is more libertarian is not at least in the French curriculum and maybe not in the UK curriculum. So the spirit is also to say, okay, what is currency taught and how can we expand it? But I'm not gonna take a position to say maybe you should study only Marxian or post keynesian economics. So that's the second caveat. And, um, and so, okay, now let's start with really uh, getting into the core. So maybe for those who are not economists and who are not teaching economics and who are not students in economics, we can start with some broad observation of the field um, today. So um, have you heard of this article um, from the Journal of Economics Perspective uh, called The Superiority of Economists? Does it sound familiar to you? So it's an article that has been um, written by two sociologists and one economist. And it has been widely publicized uh, two or three years ago, uh, even by the American Economic Association, that is the most powerful association in the world of economists. And what they were trying to do um, is to a bit understand the position of economics within the social sciences. Mm -hmm. So the, my first observation is 
that's why also we're all here, is economics is the dominant social sciences because of its influence in policy making. And also, they wanted to show how economics was completely insulated from other social sciences. So they used biometric data to see how social scientists quote each other. So maybe, for instance, you're a political scientist, yeah. so you quote economists, mm -hmm. but they don't quote you. Yeah, yeah. So that was one of the point of the paper. So, so the first maybe broad observation that we can all agree on is economics is the dominant social sciences. Um, second thing, we have to recognize that economics is taught in bachelors of economics, but economics is also taught in business school, in engineering school, in political science department. So it's very crucial to think about what would be a good introduction to economics, but not just for future professional economists. And that's really what the, st the spirit of the student movement. And I put a picture of Greg Mankiw, who is, um, who is responsible for the introduction to economics at Harvard. Because the introduction to economics at Harvard is not taken only by economics major, it's also taken by political science major, public policy major, sociology major. And he's quite senior. He was an advisor, for instance, to George Bush, but he understands that it's strategic to teach introduction to economics. Yeah. Because some people, they maybe in their life only have two classes in economics. But it's really set the tone of how does an economist think and what are the good practices. Mm -hmm. So it's very strategic, I think, even in this context of this cathedra, to have an influences on introduction to economics across different schools, engineering, political science, um, policy. Um, and finally, I think it's the same in Spain, but it's what something we notice also in our statistics is that people who do a full degree in economics, most of them are not going to be, um, are not going to go on a PhD track. Mm -hmm. So maybe they will stop at the master level. And the, um, I don't know how is it here in Spain, but the image we have when we think of economists in France, they will show us picture of the IMF or the World Bank. But we know that in reality, a lot of economics like you work in regional development, mm -hmm. in social policy, mm -hmm. and is and it's something that is not very well repre well represented in the media, or also in the kind of career path you can have. So it's important. That was my first point. My third point is that how can we shape the representation of what what do economics um, students do after they graduate? And it's important uh, to to play on this too. And uh, my fourth point observation would be that. Um, we don't know the causality, but in a lot of countries from Austria to France, we notice that there's a, a downward trend in um, economics enrollment. So we noticed that there's less people graduating, graduating in economics, but we don't really know why they choose to change field, or maybe they didn't uh, register, register in economics. Maybe they prefer, I don't know, math or social sciences, we don't know, but this is an observation. Mm -hmm. And that is a useful argument mm -hmm. that we've used as students to talk to professors. Because mm -hmm. they are like, they're thinking like businessmen, it's like, oh, I'm losing market share. Why do they choose another discipline? So why maybe they prefer particular sciences? Mm -hmm. So that's important to keep in mind too. Um, now, um, here I'm speaking as someone who is a student organizer, um, but each time we try to talk uh, about economic education, we always have in mind that it's a four-player game. So here I'm, I'm speaking um, uh, from a student's perspective, but and we have some people who are uh, like you professors, um, and it's really important because you are the one who's going to teach and provide some teaching material. But we also always had in mind a third group of people uh, that are the school managers. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something that you can have an inference on because you are local policy makers mm -hmm. and you are professors. And as student, when we devise our strategy, we always thought, okay, um, in France, if you are in, not in Paris, but in another region, and you want to shape um, your bachelor degree, your master degree, we ask them from kind of business perspective, do you want to look at what Harvard does and try to copy the same without the same resources? Or do you want to create another niche that can be useful for the region and that can make university and your curriculum known for its own identity? Mm -hmm. So that's another strategy um, that we fought in this kind of um, for um, player game. And 
the fourth group that I had little chance to talk with uh, are employers. So again, as local policymakers, and we, we talked about this um, informally yesterday, but you, it's so important, that's why I'm so happy to be here, is like you can shape the kind of demand for what kind of students you want. Mm -hmm. And um, in the UK, uh, they really manage to have some discussion with the employers, but I mean, it's good, so, but they mainly talk to people in central banks on consultancy. And it's important to talk to these people too, but maybe they didn't engage enough with the people at the regional level. But it's so important because in France, I know that um, usually professors, when they re refuse to listen to us, they say, yeah, but if you do sociology and qualitative studies and not just econometrics, you're gonna be jobless. And this is what they tell us. While if you talk to real employers, even working in banks or uh, regional development, they say, no, we want people who can listen, who can read well, who can write well, who can persuade. Mm. And that's why I think I'm talking to people working here in this cathedral. It's very important that your voice is heard as an employer, mm. because otherwise the persons are just gonna shut us down. So there's no student here, but I'm gonna give you a little uh, uh, playbook secret of how did the movement emerge after the crisis in 2010 and what did we do for the past five, six, eight years uh, in, in different states. So um, have, you, have you heard uh, before, for instance, about rethinking economics or post-crash Manchester? Who is familiar with this movement? Okay, so. Great, so I, I put this slide, I mean, that's great. So I put this slide and I say step one, make some noise. So uh, I just put some screenshots of major newspapers such as The Guardian or The Financial Times. So th this was the title obviously, but um, the, this was more in back 2011, 2012, 2013. So the, the first step was really just to write some text together, um, super short text to say, okay, what is wrong with economics education in a very provocative way. Um, so different students did this in different countries, in different cities, but gradually, thanks to the internet, that, that was something we couldn't do before, uh, we started to have Skype call and started to think, okay, how can we make a bigger splash? So the lesson here is you don't have to be that many people. If you find some alliances in other countries, it can, it can look big. So one of the major moments for us was to publish an open global letter um, two years ago. And at the same day, we published the same column uh, in Le Monde in France, El País, uh, The Guardian, and in other major newspapers across Europe. Um, and this really helped us to get some attention. So after that, uh, you had some small article in the Financial Times and they really wanted to understand, okay, uh, why aren't you happy? So uh, the, the first um, screenshot I put, so it's a bit splashy, but it's from The Guardian, and it, it really helped to attract even more student interest in that. So they put university economics teaching isn't an education, it's a 9,000 pound lobotomy. Yeah. So these arguments work well in countries where you have student fees. But even in other countries, it, it works pretty pretty well too because there's a there's a, a trend to increase student fees. So that's the kind of argument we, we constantly used and it works in, in some ways. Um, so that was the first step. The second step is, um, so when we started to be enough and with enough resources, um, we thought, okay, um, a lot of argument we give as objective is about how we feel, how our expectation uh, have been disappointed, hasn't been met in our concrete teaching. Um, but professors, school administrators, journalists didn't really trust us. They look, okay, visibly you look very passionate about this, but I want some proof, I want evidence. So it's kind of, I want evidence-based policy. So we thought, okay, what can we do? So um, in France, four years ago, we thought, okay, um, we're only maybe five people, but if we split, um, uh, we, our, our working group, maybe we can look at all the bachelors. Uh, uh, to uh, maybe to, oh yeah. Yeah. Never. So we thought, okay, um, 
if school administrators, professors don't believe us, what can we do? Maybe we can show that there's a general problem in the whole countries. So we took, I mean, this is the international study, but it started uh, in France. So we did something very simple. We thought, okay, we're gonna just look at all the 50 buffers of economics in France and count all the courses and look at the titles. Yeah. So it's really to see, okay, do you have the keyword history sometime? Mm -hmm. Do you have um, other methods? So it was really descriptive statistics, but counting all the courses and trying to see, okay, what, what is prevailing? What are the most taught courses? So one of the first results was that um, one out of five courses is just only mathematics and econometrics. So I'm not gonna say it's good or bad, I'm just gonna say this is how it is. Um, and it's the same as the international level of the 13 countries. So the results are really similar uh, across, uh, across the countries. Um, the second thing we noticed is that most of the curriculum was built around just m macro and micro. So usually you move, we can focus on that later on. Okay, introduction to micro and then micro one, two, three. And it's the same for macro. So you don't really have a topic oriented courses. So usually students, when they come, they're very disappointed because they think they're gonna have, okay, I have a full course in globalization and maybe I'm gonna learn, of course, micro and macro through a specific issues, but it's not the case. So we came up with that and um, and what is more interesting is what not what we found, but what we didn't find. Mm -hmm. And what is was obvious uh, too is for instance in France, across uh, 50 bachelor's degree, there was only one university with one option course, one elective course on philosophy of science. So it means that I think it was in Aix Marseille, so it's like in southern France, you have one option just to understand what are the tools economic use and how you can, uh, is it scientific? What are the um, foundation of scientificity? Um, how do economists work differently or not from physician, uh, physicist, sociologist, historian? So just some distance toward what we're learning. And this is what's really striking uh, to, to other students too. If you study history, you spend a lot of time doing historiography. So you spend a lot of time to think, how do historians produce knowledge? If you're a sociologist, you spend a lot of time to think, oh, maybe what I do have an influence in the people I study. So you spend, or oh, in political yeah. science too, you spend a lot of time to think, okay, what, what is my practice as a researcher? What is, um, what is, what makes what I say legitimate? How can it change? Maybe I have to be careful. And in economics, not at all. You just learn to the tools. So my main message here is not to go into the detail of statistics, is to say that in contrast to other social sciences, political science, history, sociology, in economics, they just give you the tools, you learn them, you do a lot of micro uh, exercise set, and that's stop here. Step three, so maybe that's how, uh, if you read the news, you heard of our movement. Uh, you, so if you're a student, um, you can make uh, enough noise so people in university are gonna pay attention. But the great things uh, uh, with this kind of international student movement is that we've been able to reach to some bigger speakers, people who have established position that can show some support. So I'm, I, uh, Maybe there's such people for you here uh, in this area. Um, but so on the left, I put uh, Andrew Alden. So he's uh, currently the chief economist of the Bank of England. And the British students, uh, four years ago, what they did is that they, they noticed that he, he wrote some very interesting working papers about financial stability. And at the time, he was not yet the chief economist, but he had some established position, some influence. So he recruited people, he does policy making, and he wrote the foreword of one of the student reports to complain about economics teaching. So it really helped uh, to have on board someone like him. And now he's a chief economist and he even wrote the foreword uh, of a book written by three students from the former student movement, the Econocracy. So just an example to say um, it really helped to have him because then people take students seriously. Um, I also try to put people who are from very completely different fields. So his specialty is obviously macro and financial stability. But for instance, Maria Mazzucchetto, she works on uh, financial market, innovation and growth. And um, again, students ask her to come and give some lectures. And 
she she did it, but she also in other interviews will say, okay, this what student movement is doing is very important. So just one line in her interview really help us uh, to legitimize our claims. And finally, the third person uh, that really really helped at the time of our open global letter was Thomas Piketty because his book was a huge success um, three four years ago, and he signed the petition uh, with us. And it really, really helped us to get some attention. And even three years ago in an interview, he said um, very publicly, he said, I think it's completely crazy to have specialized economics courses at undergraduate level. It doesn't make sense. We need a real social sciences uh, bachelor's degree. So just like two lines like this, it really helped us because of his institutional position then to come to other, um, to other professors and school administrators. So I'm not saying we should only focus on the big stars uh, to move uh, to, to move forward uh, our, our our movement, but um, it's important to find this kind of people. And I think that with with time, this kind of ideas become more maybe accepted. Mm -hmm. So even people working at the Euro Central Bank may be interested in this kind of thing. You just have to find them. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to agree on everything, but uh, it's important also to. Uh, to make students more comfortable, uh, and their parents too, <laughs> who are, can put some pressure sometimes. And now I'm, I want to get very specifically maybe in the detail of what kind of teaching we want. Um, so I, I put um, just an example of a first year, first semester curriculum we would like to have. So. Um, how how is how is a regular curriculum today? So uh, as was, I think we can agree and raise your hand if it's not the case. It's usually just like introduction to micro, macro, micro one, micro two, and you don't really have topics. So sometimes you have something like okay, money and banking, mm -hmm. but it just happens from time to time. So here the idea was to to say okay. Um, what we want as students was to focus on real relevant issue. So we start with a problem. So for instance, let's say unemployment, just randomly. Uh, we start with a real problem and then from there, we, we're trying to think, okay, what are the tools we need? What are the theories we need? How can we learn more about the topic? And by doing that, naturally, you will have what we call pluralism. But, but you don't start by saying, I need a checklist of theories, discipline. You start with, okay, what is a real concrete problem? So for instance, if we take unemployment, instead of having like a sub part of microeconomics that is labor microeconomics, like a lot of students have in the first year of economics, you can think, okay, um, okay, who, who does the statistics of unemployment? So you can start by thinking, how has the categories been constructed? So just by asking this question, you are forced to look at what historian of statistics did, you have forced to also um, look at um, maybe monography of how, what are the consequences of unemployment. You are, so then you are first, even if you don't care at first, to look at so what sociologists did. So I have in mind um, an example of a, of a research someone who was part of a movement did. So he's French, but he, he looked at the consequences of mass unemployment at the very micro level. Mm -hmm. So it's just an example of like, the kind of course we can give. So he did his PhD in Paris School of Economics, but it was very really nice because they allow him to kind of carry on this kind of method. So you say, usually when we look at crisis of mass employment, you look at it as a macro phenomenon. But how does it impact household budget? How does it impact families, real families? And he was really trying to play with different scales. So what he did was something that student can do as a experimental project too. He did ethno accounting. So he looked at, um, he followed a, a Spanish family over several years and really, and he looked at everything they buy, everything they spend and all their income stream. So as a student, I mean, y you can really do that. And this is economics because you, you really learn on how budget constraint works, what the, the consequences in the household. So it's not to take a position saying it's good or bad, but it's really to see how it works. So. Um, that's an example of things exercise can do at no um, at no accounting and also by doing that you realize that um, if you do social policies that 
a lot of uh, the way a household reorganizes a budget maybe is not taken into account in the so in what you target when you do social policy. Because, I mean, if you follow a household over time, you see that, oh, there's something called the informal economy. And so you have to reintegrate in the career economy things that you try to ignore. And that's an example of the kind of exercise you can do. So here, um, as I said, we start with the topics, and then we think, OK, what are the tools we can use, and what are the disciplines we can use? And of course, um, for a lot of reasons, it doesn't mean you don't do math or you don't do econometrics, but it means that you do this along all the methods, and you try to integrate uh, the two of them. So in this example of the household in no uh, accounting, so it, it's both, because you have to really talk to the family, make them uh, comfortable enough to share this. But then, of course, you have to enter this in some Excel. You have to do uh, descriptive statistics. So it's a good way also to learn uh, the basic tools in, as a first year as a comic student. Um, and then there was, uh, we tried to be methodic. So we say, OK, uh, but it sounds like a checklist. So we don't want to do this, but it's important to keep this in mind. So we said, a good curriculum try to integrate the three pluralism. So it, it might sound a bit boring for some of you if you're already familiar with that. But the idea here is to say, uh, you can't study all the theories. So you can't take a course and say, OK, it has to have uh, uh, neoclassical, behavioral, Marxist, post kantian No, it's not a list of, uh, like you go to the supermarket and you make a list of theories that should be there. But it's still a good way to see if if there's only one established way of doing things, or if the professors or the curriculum try to bring different perspectives. So the first idea was to say, okay, you should study different economic theories. Um, the second idea is to say, okay, even if you don't have the time to go in depth in different theories, you have to give your students the tools so that they can take some distance with what you teach them. So one good way to do that, um, and it's, it will really be an ideal course. So if you have some any influence on any um, curriculum, it would be very, very cool to have a history of economic thought together with economic history. And so one thing I want to say is that this claim has been made, I found some archives um, by students at Columbia University already in, the 19, in 1939. They say, why do we study Adam Smith, Ricardo, whatever on the side, and we just read all text, and then we will study, I don't know, um, uh, the in the, like the Industrial Revolution on the other side. They say, no, you want to study the theories together with the fact and see how the historical context has shaped the theories. So it's not, again, to judge the theories, but it's just to see that things are contingent, that they can change, and that is related to politics and institutions. So a very concrete things that can be immediately improved is to have a history uh, of facts and thoughts all together. And even if you don't have no time to study Marxian, post kantian whatever, even just that, even in a super neoclassical mainstream economics will already be good. Because then it makes students understand that um, economy or economics is flexible and that you can change it because things have changed naturally. Um, and finally, um, as you mentioned in the introduction, if understood well, um, we want to integrate other disciplines. So I already mentioned sociology, anthropology, and history. But one point we, we made each time we talk to the professors is that you don't want to, to, to add a little bit of sociology, a little bit of history, or like you know la the layers in the lasagna. You really want to make to use this discipline and use these professors to think about the same problem. While acknowledging that sometimes they look at the same phenomenon, but they, they project different concepts. And that's OK. But for students, is is as if um, a good way to look at it, I think, is to look at it as learning multiple languages. So we, we all say, oh, it's good to be bilingual, like a lot of people here in Spain, or trilingual. So to learn about the economy is the same. You want to, even if you're not a sociologist, you want to be able to speak with a sociologist to say, okay, where I see optimization, you see power and conflict. So it's not to say you have to agree or you have to see everything through power, conflict, uh, um, and social class, but just to be aware that that's another way to look at the world. Mm. 
uh, in the same, you can do it with psychology and like just or geography, uh, this geography here. Um, so that was a bit of the idea. But to be very honest, my personal experience is that it's really hard to do it, even with all the social scientists. So I'm happy you're a political scientist <laughs> and you're here. But um, when we come and we, we try to speak, for instance, with sociologists, um, they say, OK, that sounds interesting. But I work on religion. I work on culture. Yeah. I don't want to work on household budget. Or I don't want to look at financial markets. Yeah. So sometimes it's a, it's a bit sad that or even other social scientists, they don't want to confront directly economists on the ground. Mm. Uh, but I mean, in, in the research uh, area, I know, and we know that sociologists can also work on money or banks. But still, at the teaching level, mm. they still feel, what I mentioned at the very beginning, some inferiority complex. Mm. So I think that um, by, by teaching this, by gathering more students, by also connecting with policymakers, people in established position, you can kind of re rebalance this kind of inferiority complex that, that um, maybe as sociologists, you can also do an internship at the US Central Bank, and maybe you have very interesting thing to say about inflation too. Mm. So that's, that's what I hope um, uh, will change, mm. and through your initiative also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so just um, the, 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 the second part. So I want to dig a bit more into um, the existing curriculum. So I already mentioned it, but um, have you seen a curriculum that doesn't look like that? So <laughs> that hasn't uh, this kind of uh, progression. So intro and then intermediate, and then maybe in the third year you can choose some electives. Because So some people I saw in the side of the room said that they teach economics, so mm. do you teach your course that doesn't look, or curriculum that doesn't look like that? You can translate? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Ah, excuse me. Okay. This is the traditional okay. course. Okay, so, sorry, so thank you. So, I mean, I want, we just wanted to be sure that uh, mm -hmm. we were not just like projecting in uh, maybe just U uh, yeah, I mean yeah. the UK or US, so it's good that it's uh, the same uh, kind yeah. of benchmark yeah, here yeah. too. Um, so yeah, so the, okay, this is a typical existing curriculum. And now I just want to dig a little bit further in um, an alternative curriculum. And so, more of what would be an ideal curriculum and what is the spirit. So I'm just going to divide it into four points. And I want to mention that this comes from a task force by the Institute for New, New Economic Thinking and a task force that has been put together in 2010. So I just want to make this point by saying that it has almost been 10 years. Uh, and there was some minor change in some universities, but not yet. So maybe here you can really <laughs> Um, really do things. So this is the kind of um, ideal curriculum, at least in spirit. So it looks, it looks a lot like what the students um, um, argue uh, for. So the, each year has a, spe a specific mission. So the first year, what you really want is to have a broad understanding of the economy. Why? Because in a lot of countries, we know that people, they start and they want to major in economics and then they do something else. So the first year is really to, give an, uh, to make it interesting and to make it interesting to, uh, be and related to the real economy. So what we put by economics of the real world is, for instance, um, you can look at how accounting works. So sorry, I'm coming a lot with accounting, but I think it's a, it's a, good, um, um, it's a good tool to understand what practitioner use and also is a good tool to see some differences with like the vertical neoclassical economics. So you look at how um, can the kind of the uh, accounting of the household I mentioned, but you also look at balance sheet of firm. So you can just spend like two classes on that, but this gives you a really good foundation after to read the financial press. And then on your own, you can go to report of company and to see, okay, this is how they allocate resources. Um, the second very important course will be what is completely missing in every country is what we call basic concept and philosophy of science. So this is taught even I'm sure in uh, 
in uh, um, chemistry, physics, mathematics, you look at the history of sciences, like what does it mean by experimental, natural, what, what are the methods, is it like deductive, abductive? So just to, to have an idea of how you build sciences and what are the different type of sciences and how come there's disagreement and it's still sciences. So just for first year students is to show two things. That's what people, what people really do and then how do people think about what people do. And then we put some basic tools. So the basic tools, as I say again, um, of course you want to do basic uh, mathematics so you can do the micro exercise, but you also want the student to be able to read and write. So that's also the spirit of this island curriculum, but also the student curriculum that is based on a broad observation. As an economist, you spend a lot of time trying to persuade other people to do things. So you spend a lot of time to uh, talk to policymakers and regardless of your ideology or political position, one thing we can notice, economists are always disappointed that the policymakers don't do what they want. So that's a, a very important skill uh, to learn. So to talk to the policymakers, but also to talk to journalists, to talk to citizens, because economics is a dominant uh, sciences, so they, there's a lot of pressure to give and deliver answer. Um, and finally, the fourth big courses, will be about what we call unsettled issues and continuing debate. So it's really to, to show that some, in some topics, you will never have one single answer. Mm. And, and, and it's to, for instance, again, employment, labor, you can see that it has been unsettled since the early 20th century. Mm. So just we're not saying, okay, this is how we should think about this. Again, it's to say, okay, this is how people disagree over this and why, and why some um, theories, for instance, in the 1970s uh, prevailed while they were considered completely crazy maybe in the, in the 90s, 30s. So uh, here, while focusing on that, uh, you can take the kind of checklist I gave at the very beginning, like, okay, do you study different theory, different method, different uh, discipline, but it's not built around this kind of checklist. It's really built around the real world. Um, and then, so the second year is, it will focus on what we call the real like, kind of competencies. So here you want to train people who actually can maybe start an internship that can be really useful. Um, so here, for instance, of course, we added some econometrics because it's a way uh, to produce some uh, artifacts, it's a way maybe to do impact studies, to do uh, policy evaluation, and this is trendy, so you need to use the tools, but it's just a tool. You can say a lot of things with the same tool. Yeah. Um, and, and finally, the third year, uh, so it's built around the third year curriculum. Um, here, we the idea is to leave students the choice to focus on, on their own area of interest. So usually, in a lot of countries, you write like a student thesis, and here you can really choose maybe I want to focus on ecology, gender, money, and banking. So here they can choose. So this is very broad, but this is very, very different from what is offered. And I, I insist by saying that this is like a, what Inet uh, suggested eight years ago, but this is also what a lot of student movement suggested. So I'm saying that um, after that, if I have your emails, I can send a lot of links on, on, on different institutions and people who can have pushed for this, so maybe it can help to make the, to make the case. Um, here I don't want to think about the practical, um, I mean, for now, I don't want to think about the practical way of doing this, because if you start immediately to think about all the constraints, you cannot have enough radical imagination to come with something. But it's just a starting point of discussion. Mm -hmm. So just like coming with something like this, you can still, that's what we try to do. We talk to the school administrator and say, okay, look at this, and I think, and say, there's a lot of students who love this. There's, we can find professors that can teach this, 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 and yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just need to make it happen. But it's just a starting point of, of discussion. So that was the main first um, um, part of my talk. So if you're interested, we can, we can uh, already have some Q&A on this part, but the presentation is not over. But how, how long do we have? Uh, we have until half an hour. Okay. Until um, 
Okay, so I have, an, I have another part that is very much more concrete, but I think for now, like I said, a lot of things, so I would like really to have uh, some of you bueno, on si, your feedback. Si voleu fer al, algun comentari ara o alguna pregunta de la primera part de la, de la sessió, de la presentació, perquè ja ara canviarà una mica de tòpic, anirà a temes més concrets, però si voleu fer algun comentari vinculat a aquest aspecte més general o de com reorientar, sisplau. Please. Uh, uh, un moment que posarà... El... Bé, bueno, podria parlar amb anglès macarrònic, però ah, millor, millor fer-ho en català. Eh? Eh, bé, jo soc sociòleg i a mi hi ha una dada que trobo demolidora, que és que amb 50 graus una assignatura sobre metodologia de la ciència. Això, amb ciències socials, és incomprensible. És, és terrible. Terrible. Eh, per, i si això va acompanyat amb el que dieu vosaltres, que amb estudis bibli biblioeconòmics, d'anàlisis de bibliografia, hi ha poca interacció amb altres ciències, explica molt ja eh, la situació de l'economia actual. I, i claríssimament s'ha d'hibridar amb les altres ciències socials. És, és gran part de, sol de la solució, entenc que passa per aquí. I, per tant, us agraeixo la, la feina que esteu fent de, des del vostre lloc. No? Ah, sí. Thank you a lot for, for your comments. Um, one thing we notice as students in general is that maybe sociologists um, are too modest. So um, what do you mean by that? Um, if you're a sociologist, usually you are very reflexive or political sciences about what is expertise, what may be legitimate, maybe I should think twice about saying something. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, economists are not like this. So you're always a bit too yeah. slow. So for instance, um, in the US or in France, we have um, um, the Council of Economic Advisors. Mm -hmm. So they work directly in France with the prime minister and they produce a lot of uh, reports but you, I mean, by that are very short, mm -hmm. that are not so empirical, but a little bit. But these people, the 10 people in this uh, Council of Economic Advisors, they have a lot of power. They speak in the media. Mm -hmm. uh, when they publish once a month a little report about, I don't know, uh, regulation of product market or mm -hmm. the effect of this labor law on the region, it has some importance. And, um, what I noticed in France, so uh, maybe it's very different here and you have uh, other initiative and ambition, but sociologists, they maybe within each other disagree more. So they have maybe a harder time to work together. And then even when they're able to work together, um, they don't want to play the game of expertise or the media. So I have no answer of like, is it a good thing or no? But it's just to say like as a student, when we try to invite some expert in other social sciences, the, the claim they make were uh, not as assertive and strong, and they didn't build really kind of think tank or institution where they can repu produce memo or report that can easily be diffused and shared. So I don't know if you have to play the same game as economist to, to make it and have an inference in the public debate, but uh, this is what we noticed. So, the, the, do you feel is this the same in your context that economists are, um, even when they disagree, they understand that they have to agree on the minimum base to get the message across? Okay. Well, I mean, I think sociologists actually are also, also sociologists on the side, <laughs> and they, they maybe they tend to be more modest or l have less solidarity even with each other. Yeah. So, I don't know, uh, did you feel is the same or? <coughs> no veig potser tan així. Primer hi ha, penso, hi ha una qüestió de, del lloc que ocupes a la societat i a les estructures de poder. I aquestes estan cooptades per economistes i per economistes. Hi ha el 90% de les vegades de determinades eh, teories, teories o filosofies econòmiques. I per tant, si tu ocupes l'oposició central, eh, encara que no vulguis, estàs emetent i imposant el, eh, diguem, el, el teu discurs. Els sociòlegs, evidentment, són, són més crítics i hi ha més controvèrsia a nivell de, de discurs, de debat teòric. 
entre sociòlegs, a les facultats, a l'acadèmia, etc. Entre els economistes, la meva visió des de fora és que hi ha molt menys pluralisme dins dels departaments d'economia i dins de les facultats i que històricament, i suposo que hi ha influències externes també perquè determinats economistes o o determinades visions econòmiques segueixin emetent el discurs central constantment cap a la societat de les polítiques econòmiques que són com si fossin física estricta, l'economia és això i les receptes són aquestes i ja està. I jo crec que hi ha un problema intern de l'economia que que és una cosa que estudiaré ara, que el que has apuntat tu, que és la seva poca interacció amb altres ciències socials. Per exemple, jo crec que sociologia i psicologia són com ciències que donen base a l'economia. L'economia és quasi un model psicològic. La micro i tot això, hi ha un model psicològic a darrere de com funciona la diguem, la conducta humana, la conducta econòmica humana, etc. I hi ha molt poca interacció entre psicologia, sociologia, economia... I de quina de les dues parts és culpa? No ho sé. Jo crec que més culpa dels economistes, que són els que tenen més poder i que, per tant, poden fer més per trencar això, perquè ells són els que tenen més poder a nivell social, a nivell estructural dins de la societat, per dir-ho així. Però no ho sé, potser hi ha lògiques estrictament acadèmiques i històriques que ho expliquen. Tampoc m'ho he parat a pensar molt. Però, bueno, diguem, estic molt amb el discurs que feu vosaltres i els currículums que proposeu, que és que té que ser això. Sí, és comentar una cosa bastant ràpida. Penso que també un dilema que estem assistint no és tan sols únicament a l'economia o a l'ensenyament de l'economia, sinó és el dilema entre tecnocràcia i democràcia, que és un dilema força antic. I d'alguna manera és el que marca també estructura el poder i estructura les relacions en les societats. I potser la ciència econòmica ha estat una de les més capturades per el discurs tecnocràtic, que és el que li ha permès fer aquesta posició dominant en la societat. Però jo diria també que per salvar una mica la ciència econòmica diria que ha estat capturada per el fenomen, que és un fenomen polític que pot passar també en altres disciplines. Hola, soc el Marc López, treballo al Pla Estratègic Metropolità de Barcelona amb l'Oriol. Fins fa quatre dies era estudiant d'Economia i després vaig fer un màster d'Història de la Ciència i he pensat molt en tot això que s'està comentant avui, que no significa que hagi pensat bé sobre tot això, però m'agradaria apuntar alguns elements. Per exemple, l'economia, si anem a l'origen, és la unió de dues paraules gregues, que és oikos i nomos, que seria la gestió de la casa. Oikos seria casa i nomos gestió de... Llavors, clar, aquí, si t'agrada estirar els conceptes i teoria de conjunts, doncs la casa pot ser tu mateix, pot ser la comunitat de veïns, pot ser la nació, inclús el planeta, l'univers, etcètera, etcètera. O sigui que hi ha un camp molt gran per per explorar, però hi ha una baula perduda, que si estem parlant d'economia, que és la gestió de la casa, no podem deixar de parlar de la ciència que estudia la casa, que seria l'ecologia. I aquí hi ha una baula perduda. Llavors, aquest és el primer punt. Després, el segon punt, que té a veure amb aquesta tecnocràcia, com s'ha segrestat l'economia per la tecnocràcia, això jo crec que som som una mica fills de la revolució científica i de quin tipus de coneixement li donem validesa. Aleshores, el coneixement que podem acceptar com a fills de la revolució científica és aquell que es pot demostrar inequívocament i unívocament, que és el coneixement que es produeix a través del llenguatge matemàtic. 
Llavors, per tant, i una de les crítiques que se li ha fet molt a l'ensenyament d'economia és que els alumnes poden no estudiar per l'examen els capítols d'equitat i de coses d'aquestes, perquè ja són altres tipus de conceptes que no pots fer cap demostració amb el llenguatge matemàtic. Després, i té a veure amb això, és el des del meu punt de vista, i no només l'economia, sinó totes les ciències socials tenen un complex d'inferioritat cap a les ciències naturals. Per això, per quin tipus de coneixement ens podem fiar. Després, crec que és molt important diferenciar economia de procés econòmic. L'economia és la teoria que explica el procés econòmic que és tot. I el procés econòmic és el fet que respirem, el fet que estiguem aquí, el fet que anem a dinar, tot el que passa és procés econòmic i entra dins la cadena d'extracció, transformació, consum i rebuig. Llavors, amb tot això, amb tots aquests elements, crec que necessitem una nova narrativa i una figura clau que a mi m'agrada molt i l'he llegit molt i és una simplificació de la història de la ciència, hi ha una manera d'ensenyar història de la ciència que es diu From Plato to Nato i és la història tu. La història tu pots dir que tot el coneixement és gràcies a Plató, Aristòtil, Copèrnic, Kepler, Newton, Darwin i Einstein i ja està. Però jo afegiria un altre que seria el Nicolás Jorge Escorreguen i la seva obra, sobretot la llei de l'entropia i el procés econòmic, i seria una base fonamental per ensenyar economia. I ja està. Moltes gràcies. Si vols un altre... Sí, 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 sí. Bé, em presento. Jo em dic Albert Puig i soc profe d'Economia a la Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. Em dono la impressió que aquí estem representats els científics socials que no són de l'economia i pels que conec d'economia, els que alguna vegada ens hem plantejat si això d'ensenyar l'economia ho estem fent bé o no. Per tant, no tenim els que creuen en el que realment està vigent en els en aquests plans d'estudi que ens has ensenyat. És a dir, aquí estem segurament els que ens hem preguntat alguna vegada si això ho estem fent bé. Jo només vull fer un preu de tres comentaris. El primer és aquesta... Diguem, això de l'economia és una ciència social, diguem, és una afirmació que en la professió hi ha molta, diguem... El que predominen són economistes que preferirien ser físics, diguem, o matemàtics, perquè se senten més còmodes perquè se senten més, diguem, ser considerat un científic social et genera moltes més preguntes, no? I la comoditat del que tot encaixa en la física o en la matemàtica és més còmoda, no? I aquests són els que, diguem, són aquests els que tenen el poder que abans comentava algú en les institucions, en el poder polític, aquests són els que han arribat en el poder acadèmic, eh? I els altres estan una mica, no sé si en la marginalitat de l'acadèmia, però una mica en les estructures més perifèriques, habitualment. L'altra, una altra cosa que també jo crec que també peca aquest plan d'estudi és que s'ha traslladat aquesta idea que hi ha una història del pensament econòmic que ja s'ha acabat i que per tant això ha desembocat en la micro i la macro i ara expliquem la veritat. En realitat, quan fem micro i macro, seguim fent pensament econòmic. El pensament econòmic no s'ha acabat. Tenim un model que ha triomfat, que és el que s'explica, però hi ha més micros i hi ha més macros. És a dir, no és la micro i la macro el problema. El problema és quina micro i quina macro només expliquem. Una altra cosa que també els economistes hem anat perdent, jo crec, és la humilitat. Ni tan sols la crisi econòmica ha posat en qüestió el model. El model neoclàssic, les expectatives racionals dels actors, tot aquest tipus de coses, evidentment ha fallat. La crisi ho posa en qüestionament, però en canvi el model segueix vigent. Ningú l'ha posat en qüestionament especialment. 
Una altra cosa interessant també, en la meva opinió, que a vegades, no sé si ha sigut una qüestió de traducció, però inclús els que ens preguntem a vegades creiem, 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 amb errors, diguem, una mica, diguem, que ja portem tant a dintre que ni en som capaços de, no? Jo no sé si ha sigut la traducció, però ha dit, els empresaris donen feina, els empresaris no donen res diguem, o els empresaris creen ocupació, no sé, també ha sortit una frase així, diguem, la creació d'ocupació és el resultat de relacions socials, de producció, de consum, de distribució, etcètera, però, diguem, tenim aquesta sensació que alguns creen i els altres, no sé, hi participen d'una altra manera, però, és a dir, crear creem tots, és a dir, crea la societat o crea aquestes relacions socials que s'hi estableixen, no? I l'altra cosa final que volia dir és una mica... Aquí, en aquests plans d'estudis es veu, hi ha una mica el problema de com organitzem els plans d'estudis pel que fa a l'ordre. És a dir, com expliquem el que passa, com expliquem les eines, els mètodes i els instruments, com expliquem, com introduïm l'acció, és a dir, la política, és a dir, com fem, què fem, com expliquem, quan expliquem, o quan estan preparats els estudiants per poder analitzar les polítiques, quines polítiques poden fer, i a sobre hi hem d'introduir aquesta falera, que això és la pregunta que volia fer al final, de les competències. És a dir, això que ara hem d'estar ensenyant també a treballar en grup, hem d'ensenyar també a fer servir internet i totes aquestes coses. És a dir, tinc la sospita que almenys en el camp de l'economia les competències és la trampa per acabar de treure els continguts. És a dir, els continguts i la pluralitat. Una mica algú una vegada em va dir un d'aquests economistes que avui no són aquí perquè són dels que estan en el poder acadèmic em va dir no hem de fer servir les aules com un púlpit ideològic com un púlpit per transmetre ideologia jo li vaig dir quan traiem d'ideologia al final n'hi deixem una i aquest és el problema que n'hi deixem una quan traiem la pluralitat acabem deixant una i la transmetem com perquè el model neoclàssic té valors el model neoclàssic a darrere hi ha valors i una altra cosa que no, que podríem entrar és com no només ensenyem l'economia a la universitat, sinó com ensenyem a les escoles, als mitjans de comunicació, és a dir, quins valors transmet quan diem que fem economia. Bé, era simplement una opinió. Molt bé, tots són una ronda de comentaris molt, molt interessants. Do you want to make any comment about this? Yes, just... Thank you a lot for your reaction. It's very interesting uh, to me to see um, like how, how you reacted to, to a bit like some uh, the student movement message. So um, the first point about the ecology and environment, I completely agree with you. It was just like a choice because I know Tim will talk about this much better than me. So I'm, I'm leaving it to him. Um, the second point that is true and it is completely ignored in what I say and in most of the student movement is what you call the tension between democracy and technocracy. Um, and, and, the, and the main reason is like I noticed even people in France who, for instance, created this beautiful uh, magazine called Alternative Economic, even them, the, when they participate in, in the media and conferences, they position themselves as experts because it's just the normal regime you've been uh, used to. And, and and it's true that even people who, who, for instance, argue for very progressive politics, when they speak at the Economist, again, they put themselves in a position of superiority. So I completely agree with that, but um, it's hard to play all the strategy and games at the same time. So um, uh, from what I've seen is that, of course, we should be aware of this, but as students, our, our strategy, in the context I know, was to kind of play the expertise game and say, okay, how to be better expert. And I, I noticed this tension also in other fields. So, uh, for instance, I read an article on the evolution of the teaching of law in the US. So it's always interesting to see what's going on in other fields. So um, I, maybe I can send a link later, but it's a very nice example of the, in the 70s, because of a lot of social movements, you have some students complaining about how law was taught in the US. So. 
after discussion and so on, you had this kind of new stream that emerges that was called law and society. So the it was it looks a bit like we're trying to do with economics. So it's mean like okay, law is not natural, it's shaped by historical condition. Maybe you should look at sociology, history, and it also happened that they were maybe more progressive politically. But the whole the whole message and the whole rhetorical argument they use when they try to um, gather support for this law and society thing was very much grounded in the idea that to lay to save. Uh, how to say, to make our expertise even more legitimate, we need to integrate all the social sciences. So it was used as a way to save, kind of, save law from itself. So it's still in the same much paradigm of like te like technocracy and expertise, but this is how they did it. And, it. and I noticed this in economics too. So it was just an anecdote, but to say that it's very hard to escape this, uh, the fundamental political question. So <laughs> Um, then on the um, maybe on the so that's one thing I, I didn't mention in the presentation, but I'm glad you come up with more like the maybe the political implication. Um, so there's two strategies that you probably noticed. Um, a lot of economists they say I I use neoclassical framework, but if you twist it, you can have progressive outcomes. So for instance, this is what Paul Grugman tries to do in the U.S. This is what Danny Roderick tries also to do in development economics. So these these people sometimes they're good allies, but sometimes they can be um, not your best friends. But so it's important to 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 realize that. And I think that from a very concrete of point of concrete perspective, sometimes it works. You say, okay, I'm gonna use ISLM. I know that for some reason it's not great, but I really want to get the message across, so I'm gonna do that. So I don't know what is the right answer, but de facto this is what a lot of economists did. And even Piketty, um, there's a lot of debates and like historians, um, business historian, and, and people working in other framework in economics has been uh, pointing at maybe the way he doesn't make a difference between um, uh, how he still reuse the neoclassical idea of marginal productivity and that what you get is what you bring into marginal productivity. Or they will pointing at the fact that he doesn't make a uh, difference between like value, wealth, and rent. So of course, there's always little issues like this, but ultimately, through his books and through his talk, he brought on the table I mean, so he's, I mean, it's not just him, like, there's a whole team behind, but he brought on the table some topics, and then through that, he can create an institute and hire re junior researcher, assistant to talk and to work on this topic, and maybe in five, ten years, push the frontier even further. But as a first step, you, unfortunately, you can move from one equilibrium to the other like this. Um, I, I and maybe to <coughs> to conclude, I, I really I, I completely agree with you in the things about jobs, like who creates jobs. So I, I know exactly what you mean. So maybe it was not very clear, but again, it's a similar kind of strategy when you are in a student movement. You have to reuse the kind of dominant ideology in some way to kind of twist it. So of course, uh, I think in in any intro to economic course, it's a very good exercise to debunk the fact that business owners say, "Oh, we're job creators." No. Just you have more uh, people who buy your things, so you're gonna hire someone. But why do people hire your things? So think, thinking in a more systematic way, uh, um, it's very much in the spirit of the student movement. So, uh, <laughs> but great that you um, you made a point. And and then finally, um, what you said about the skills and the competencies. So again, you, we can have some critical distance and 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 ask ourselves. What is this whole employability ideology, blah, blah, blah. So I completely agree with some distance and, 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 and understand where does it come from? Is it to make people feel guilty about this? That is their own individual choice to, uh, and that their fate is only individual. So of course we have to deconstruct this. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when as a student organizer, I talk to these people or to my school administrator, unfortunately, I still have to talk in their little frame and languages. So the, the, uh, I have no answer, but like I'm, I'm very much aware of this all of his tensions, and I think that it happens a lot in in, in, po in 
very concrete politics too. You have to start with kind of people common sense and then you try to <laughs> twist it. But um, I, I'm glad that we you, <laughs> you bring this up, so thank you. <laughs> We have uh, 15 minutes. Uh, do you want to, to um, make uh, some? Yeah, just a quick point then. Thank you. Sí. Alarguem ara la, la conferència 10-15 minuts més abans de fer el descans, per, perquè hem començat una mica més tard. Tindrem 20 minuts de descans. Li volia demanar si per la segona part de la conferència volia focalitzar alguns punts bàsics. Now that I had some feedbacks of you, maybe this is going to be a bit of a provocative uh, <laughs> um, part. Um, so, so um, when I, I, I thought of this part, um, it's very much in what I, I just uh, said um, in the past 10 minutes. So, the, the I mean, as a student movement, our ambition is to set a very high bar and what should be taught, so philosophy of science, mixing social sciences, and so on and so forth. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want to ignore business schools or ignore some hot topics that interest people. So I'm thinking, okay, um, maybe to be more ambitious, I, I should also try to come up with something that even the business school, uh, ESAD or HEC in France can pay attention to. Uh, so trying to find like some common overlap. Um, the second thing is also um, when I was thinking of, okay, the slide disappeared. Oh, just before. Okay, sorry, but, but that's okay. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, so okay, what can be of interest even to business school and management? Since in the statistic we notice that economics is also is very often taught together with management. And when we met the student yesterday, they, they said they studied together the first two years, like uh, economy and ASEAN Valley or something. So yeah, yeah. exactly, so I'm thinking, okay, what what common ground we can we found? And the second thing is also. I was trying to think as local policymakers. Uh, we briefly discussed this, but you have very concrete um, problems that are related to tech companies and how American tech companies come to some cities and what effect, what impact do they have. So I was thinking, how could you train future civil servants and future social scientists that can be on the same table as Airbnb, Amazon, Uber, and feel as confident? Uh, to talk to them and to be able and who are able to understand how the business model works. So not to say that they have to agree and and uh, embrace the ideology behind Uber and Amazon, but people who will understand the political economy of the digital economy, how value is distributed differently, um, what are the impact on jobs, maybe the microeconomics uh, of tech companies is different, so maybe there's not decreasing returns. So you can use this kind of entrepreneurship digital economy as a topic, mm -hmm. and then from there you will uh, have this multiple theories, multiple methods, mm -hmm. multiple disciplines. But you take something that doesn't look too dangerous um, from afar. So maybe just one minute and like give very um, mm -hmm. um, three examples. So um, one thing we, re we tried to do um, also in this kind of ideal with the student movement was to say, we want to be trained so that we can read the Financial Times and the Economist and understand everything. Um, that is not the case if you just do your micro exercise. So here um, I, I took some screenshot of um, the, the Economist and the Wall Street Journal and um, I was thinking, okay, uh, would an average student understand just the, the main title? So the first says, tech firms hoard huge cash piles. So if you're just an economic student and you follow the neoclassical fear of the firm, you don't understand why would they accumulate cash. The second thing is um, in the Wall Street Journal, say Google preserve cash and control. So, okay, what is this cash and control thing? Um, so here, when you start to ask yourself this kind of question, you can do some kind of Keynesian economics, but without saying, okay, I'm doing Keynesian economics. 
because fundamentally all this question of cash and control is how do you deal with uncertainty? How do you, do, do you deal with the fact that you cannot have probability of what's gonna happen? And because you don't know what's gonna happen, you have to preserve enough cash to gain time to, and then you can control your environment. So this is what we do maybe as individual, but this is also what companies do. And this is also what some countries did. So this example, I took it from a book uh, called Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy. And it's just an example of the kind of book you can introduce in a business school because it's been written by um, someone who has been a private equity investor, a venture capitalist, who, has a P who had a PhD in, uh, from Cambridge and he studied with some Kent students mm -hmm. and who is also one of the co-founders of the Institute for New King Thinking. So it's a kind of memoirs mixed with some uh, critical perspective. And he said, well, this cash, cash and control foundation is not what he had to learn in the neoclassical theory of the firm, but he said, in economic development, that was mercantilist countries did. You, you built, uh, that's what China is doing. So from this kind of little example about, okay, what the world does, you can also introduce another way to look at um, development in the long run. So you just try to find little frameworks that can be useful to this micro phenomenon and micro phenomenon to deal in a world of uncertainty. So here you, you can introduce this kind of realism, but by something very concrete. Um, another example, uh, we talked about Airbnb this morning. So it's also to show that you also have controversy in business strategy. So I, I took um, a screenshot from a, a magazine called The Information. So The Information is really read in the Silicon Valley. So it gives a lot of uh, hot news about companies. And what is great is that you can see that uh, even in a company like Airbnb, you have at the very top debate and controversy. So the person on the left, now he's out, he was a former chief financial officer. And the right is a branch is key, one of the co-founder. And this is a good example too, to show that on one hand, the chief financial officer put a lot of pressure for Airbnb to become a public company. So through the example, you can teach students, okay, first, what is this guy's background? What is his vision of the world? So he worked for Blackstone, a private equity firm, and uh, you can teach uh, about corporate governance. Why is he pushing for the firm to go public? What kind of money will he get? What kind of money the salary will get? Uh, but what are the co consequences in the strategy of Airbnb? And the co-founder was against, because he's not stupid. He's, he thinks, if we go public, we'll be exposed to fashion markets, so I'm gonna lose control of the company. Not just his own shares, but the strategy to create new business line, to create new product. So I don't know where is it now, but um, the main clash was about the fact that one wanted to create an airline company. Mm -hmm. And the other is like, no, we want to go public and this is too uncertain. We don't know what's gonna happen. So let's not do that. So it's just a little anecdote and maybe it's a provocative here <laughs> to show Airbnb, mm -hmm. but it's a good way to show student too that um, Innovation, entrepreneurship is collective, is uncertain, um, and um, uh, and is a process. So you have to secure resources, you have to make people work together, um, and 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 so that's an example. Um, a less example, just to show that using entrepreneurship, you can look at macro issues. Um, very, I mean, I just put these two graphs. So. Um, here on the left, I showed the interest rate of the Fed and the graph about the volume of venture capital investment, so um, in startups. So if you look at the second part of the graph, um, I don't want to get into the details, but it's a good way to, for students to show, well, what's going on in central banking policy has a direct impact um, on the economy and entrepreneurs who are successful, they know, they know this, that actually low interest rate and quality evasive using help this kind of startup. So it's not gonna say it's good or bad, but just mm -hmm. you can also do macro while looking at very micro issue. And um, then on the right, I just put the kind of a risk return uh, graph on the hedge fund <laughs> to show that on the very extreme uh, right, you have private equity and venture capital that has highly risk and high returns um, asset class. As an example also to show that you can study this and say, okay, um, where does it come from? 
um, what is the dynamics, how capitalists are always pushing the frontier. So it's like, if government bonds are not attractive enough, you want to invest in equity, but then everyone does it, so it's not attractive enough, so you push the frontier. So here, of course, you can use some theory from a German economist from a long time ago, but you don't need to say it. You can say, okay, look at this, and then you just can study Brodel and Marx and so on and so forth. Um, and he, here I'm gonna maybe conclude on that, uh, that is really focused on, on maybe your interest that is local policy making. So one thing I notice in France and I think in a lot of countries is that since Silicon Valley is super hot, a lot of local policymakers ask themselves, how can I build my own Silicon Valley? How can I have my entrepreneurial economy? How, um, how can my, my country be a startup nation? And because of some kind of diffusion imitation effect, this this is probably a conversation you had and people want to do that. But this is a good example to teach institutional theory that if you want to build a new funding agency, if you want to um, people to be whatever it means, more innovative, this is the result of a specific epoch, a specific time. So then you really have to dig deep into the history of Silicon Valley. Maybe there was some specific condition related to the Cold War, maybe for some uh, reason you had different cultures merging, maybe you had some connection between university and academia, so you really study this and you see you cannot copy and pass a model because it's a result of uh, path dependency, historical evolution, also how people perceive the thing and build discourses around it. So just using something that looks like kind of um, non-controversial like Silicon Valley and entrepreneurship or venture capital, you can integrate Martian economics, post kantian economics, institutional theories, and use several disciplines. So um, thank you if you have, I'm very curious about you, you, your reaction to this example, like studying entrepreneurship as a, as a point of departure, and uh, thank you. Well, muchas gracias.